we're here at Nep. It's about half ten, eleven o'clock, and we're listening to a male nightingale singing in this dense thicket behind us. So Nep is a rewilding project in Sussex where they've let the countryside go back to nature and they've seen loads and loads of bird species and insects and different wildlife come back. And one of the great success stories of Nep is that it's got the densest population of nightingales anywhere in the UK now. Um, and you can hear behind me, um, there's a male really going for it right by our campsite. Have a listen. Incredible. We started the wildlife pond. I have been digging this hole for what feels like ages. It's quite big, but it needs to be quite big to fit this bad boy in. Uh, starting to fill with rainwater. Chickens are supervising. And yeah, I think we're slowly, slowly getting there. Definitely just heard a woodpecker of some kind. Often the best way to find a bird in the field is to hear it first and work out where it's coming from. So James just asked, where do they lay their eggs? Adders, like our common lizard, are viviparous which means they give birth to live young, they don't lay eggs. And one of the reasons northern hemisphere reptiles like adders and common lizards give birth to live young is that if they laid eggs, they're fixed in one place and they're at the mercy of the weather. They can cool down and not have ideal incubation temperatures and conditions. Whereas if you're live bearing and you give birth to live young, you can bring your young with you wherever you go. You can thermoregulate, so you regulate your temperature to successfully incubate those babies within. In the wall of the Bathanon behind me, there's a very special little nest. How amazing is that to find a nest in such an unusual location and so trusting of people uh, close by? I guess it probably protects them from predators. I can hear a blackbird back there. Mm -hmm. So a more whistly kind of melodic kind of um, fluty sound, not that thin kind of trail, kind of a you hear that one back yeah. there? Mm. Yeah. You'll get your ear in. It's really difficult. A lot of you probably, or maybe I'm giving, giving you little credit, but some of you might be like, I can't tell them. Like, <laughs> but over the course of the morning, I think um, you will learn. We'll learn to pick out the really common ones first. So these leeches, they've got a little sucker at the back, which they attach by. And then at their head is their little biting mouth parts and eyes apparently uh, I can't see his eyes but or her eyes could be a girl not so good at sexing leeches so just found something really cool a little slow worm it's actually a legless lizard uh, not a worm at all, um, and not a snake. And you can tell it's a lizard because it blinks its eyes. So only lizards have eyelids. Snakes don't have eyelids. And I can see them blinking here. They also give birth to live young. Um, and they're one of our three native lizard species in the UK. The others being common lizard and sand lizard, which have legs. These guys have no legs, so they do look quite like a snake. Amazing little creatures. Lots of people feeding the Indian ringneck parakeets, uh, hand tame but actually wild birds. Their success story because they're highly adaptable. Where they come from is a question that's often asked. Um, it's thought that most of them did escape from aviaries and private collections and gradually built up in numbers um, to breed in this country and uh, they've been around since the 1950s I think. There is a rumour that uh, some of them escaped from the set of the African Queen at Pinewood Studios or Ealing Studios. There's also a rumour that Jimi Hendrix released them into the streets of London for some psychedelic colour. I think that's probably... Uh... Ouch, he's biting me. Ow, ow, ow. Um, probably a little bit um, imaginative, let's say. But um, no matter where they came from, they've done very well and um, they're now... Ow! Ow! Stop biting me! <laughs> Spectacle 
that we're hopefully going to see today is a starling murmuration. So a murmuration is an aerial display of starlings, often tens of thousands of birds, um, up to 50,000 this winter at Otmore. And they come together in those kind of numbers for a few reasons. One would be safety in numbers, so it's harder for predators to pick out a single starling from the flock if they're gathered in such high numbers. And doing these incredible aerial displays, shape-shifting in the sky, in massive swarms, almost like shoals of fish formation splitting the flock as predators try and dive in. Um, hopefully we'll see some of those uh, aerial attacks. Um, the second reason, apart from safety in numbers from predators, is warmth. Obviously in the dead of winter, um, small birds lose a lot of energy and lose a lot of heat during the night. So coming together and roosting very, very closely together in the reed bed habitat that we have here, but also in woods um, sometimes, or on man-made structures like piers and so on, they huddle together and conserve warmth. So that uh, saves them some energy at night. And the third reason they think is actually information exchange. So sharing with each other um, vocally and um, by heading off in different groupings where the best feeding areas are around. So the starlings coming in from miles around, you can actually just see a few coming in already in small numbers. Um, in the sky, but they're coming together from miles around and they think that they do exchange some information and let each other know where the best feeding grounds are for the for the next day. That was very exciting. I haven't seen a red squirrel since I was about 12, I think, and I just saw, I don't know how many, lost count. Uh, one of the reasons that the red squirrels do well here in Formby is because of the coniferous forest. One really interesting development that's happened in Ireland specifically, but also seeing it in the UK, is the return of the pine marten. So the pine marten is a mustelid related to stoats and weasels and otters and so on. And uh, it also inhabits kind of pine forests like the red squirrel does, and it feeds on squirrels but it feeds preferentially on grey squirrels because they're more on the ground. Um, they find it difficult to escape the pine marten, whereas the red squirrels are so small and nimble and light that they can reach the outermost branches where they feed, but that also means they can escape the pine marten when it's hunting them in trees. So where pine martens are coming back, we're seeing declines in grey squirrel populations and actually red squirrels are coming back as well as or alongside the pine marten. Really, really good news. We're seeing that in Ireland, west of the Shannon, uh, which acts as a kind of natural barrier for grey squirrel uh, spread across the country. Um, we're seeing pine martens coming back from the west coast of Ireland, where they traditionally um, remained and uh, escaped persecution in the past couple of hundred years. We're now seeing a resurgence of them into the Midlands and they're actually pushing back the grey squirrel and we're seeing the red squirrel coming back in numbers um, as a result of that. So really, really good consequence of a natural predator coming back into the ecosystem and wiping out the invasive grey. So it's night two at NEP and we are bat detecting and we're getting a load of soprano pipistrels um, buzzing right around our heads, feeding just next to the hammer pond at NEP. Uh, they're coming crazy close, you can probably just see some whizzing around in the sky behind me.